pod and a Q and a pod. So you can chat to speak with all of your uh, other attendees. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q and a pod. It makes it much easier for Pete to see them and to be able to answer your questions. And finally, don't worry, your microphone is muted. So you can dance around and sing and do whatever you want to do while watching Pete, which I know I will be doing because I will be enjoying this. How are you, Pete? Doing good. Thank you. How are you doing, Mark? Awesome. I am doing well. All right. Let's get you started. There right. you go. Okay. Let me just share screen here and we'll be off. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see my screen here and we will get started here. Um, all right. So yeah, today's topic is better code with CI. Um, so we will, we will get into what all that means. So even if you've never, you don't even know what CI stands for, um, we're going to take you from zero to a ability to hopefully be able to leverage it in some capacity. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, if you're not familiar, I've been working with Cold Fusion for decades since the 90s, late 90s. Um, I've been writing the Cold Fusion Lockdown Guide since Cold Fusion 9. Uh, some of the things I've built are that you might have heard of or used, cfscriptme, cfdocs.org. Um, I most recent thing I probably uh, launched is something called cfbreak.com, which is like a weekly newsletter to help keep you updated with all things in the Cold Fusion community, blogs and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, my blog, I'll be posting the slides to this presentation on my blog as well as on Twitter. You can find those links there. And finally, uh, my company, Foundeo, uh, provides consulting services as well as tools and services for Cold Fusion developers, uh, which such as tools like Fixinator, which we'll, we'll see a little bit in action today, and it, but also uh, FuseGuard, which is a web application firewall for Cold Fusion, and HackMyCF, which is like a server scanning tool to, to look for security configuration issues. All right, so our agenda today, first, we're going to look at what's our motivation for wanting to learn a little bit more about CI. Uh, and then we were going to look at some very simple examples to get started. And then from there, we will uh, look at actual useful examples that should be so easy that you could actually find an incredible amount of value in it um, very, very easily, I think. So I'm excited to see people start adding this to their um, to their processes and their workflows. So let's start with the motivation here. So we've all been there one Friday afternoon, you've made this simple code fix. Uh, and, and it's such a simple fix uh, that it was only even one line of code that you had to change. Uh, you added one little thing. And so you can probably guess what happens. Uh, but that I mentioned is Friday afternoon, end of the day, you've, this was such a simple fix that you just went left the office and started to enjoy your weekend. As you can guess, uh, CF query Parma is not a valid tag. Uh, and I, I know I've made that mistake a million times. I've typed CF query Parma. Uh, it's like chicken parm reminds me of for some reason. Um, so that's why we've got some spaghetti on this slide. So we could have detected that problem with CI. So, um, and, and most likely the developer would have found out the problem if we had some simple CI tools in place uh, pretty much right away as soon as they committed the fix. So, all right, so what is CI? So this is kind of like a definition here that um, Amazon Web Services, and which is one of the many, many vendors that has the CI tools on the market. So they have a tool called AWS Code Pipeline. So from their user guides is what they say. It's a continuous integration. CI stands for continuous integration. It's a software development practice where members of the team use a version control system 
And that's actually optional, but highly recommended. Um, and frequently integrate their work to the same location, such as a main branch. Each change is built and verified to detect integration errors. And this is the important part, as quickly as possible. So I don't know about you, but I would much rather fix some code that I wrote today versus some code that I wrote six years ago or even last week. Um, it's just a whole lot easier because you're already in the mental space of understanding the problem that you're trying to solve, all the potential gotchas that you've already thought through. It's way easier to fix a bug the same day it was introduced than it is after the fact. And it's just as simple as that. But if we boil it down even simpler, what is a CI? It's really just a script that runs on some sort of event. Um, and so you might also see this a lot when you when you see CI, you might also see CD along with it. So um, we're not talking about CD-ROMs here. We're talking about continuous delivery um, or continuous deployment, sometimes called. So whereas continuous integration, again, this definition here for CD is, is from the AWS pipeline uh, user guide. Continuous integration is focused on automatically building and testing code where the continuous delivery is focused on the software release process all the way up to production. So we're not really going to cover CD all that much today. Um, we're mostly focused on the CI part of it because the deployment part can be a whole another can of worms and you don't, you can still get a lot of value out of just getting started. And I, I wouldn't start with like, let's, Let's do this full elaborate plan. I think if you're gonna start with this, you start with something really simple. Um, and a simple CI script that does something useful is, is the best way to start. So what do you need if you wanna get started with continuous integration? Well, first thing you're gonna need is some code. I'm sure everyone here has some of that lying around somewhere. Next, you need some sort of CI software or service um, or a server. Um, that is going to operate on these events. So I mentioned source code, I didn't say version control. Version control is actually not required, um, but in, we're, we're kind of assuming it's there in, in almost all cases. Um, so if you, I know there's still people out there that don't use version control. And so if you need to get on that train, I would start there. And you can look at things like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, they all provide a free version control um, solution that also has built-in CI servers and services with it. Um, so let's say maybe you do have a version control, but you are not running Git. Uh, most of what you'll see is gonna assume that you're running Git, but um, it's, it's not a necessarily a requirement. So you can actually, if you're using Subversion, for example, you can still set up and do all these things we're gonna sh show you with Subversion. It's just gonna be a little bit different of a, of a setup process. It might not be as, as easily integrated as it would with, um, with uh, a Git repository. So what are some CI tools that you could use? And here's a couple here. Those, so there's GitLab, GitHub, Git Bitbucket there on the top. All those three on the top provide version control hosting for you. And they also provide CI, C, uh, CD server uh, hosting as well in, a, in like a tool set for you to be able to build upon. Um, so I would say if you're not sure, I would start with one of, the, one of those on the top row initially because it's gonna give you kind of an all-in-one bundle. Um, not that there's anything um, bad about the ones on the bottom row there. And there's actually even more tools here to, just listing a few. Um, some are easier or better than others. But um, the advantage of going with, with like GitLab, GitHub, or Bitbucket is that it's just gonna be a whole lot easier to, to get set up because it's all kind of integrated and seamless. Whereas um, if you're gonna connect, say like Jenkins to GitHub, then you have to make sure you set up an authentication route between the two. And there's a little, just a little bit more configuration. Um, but they're all, they're all great tools and they all provide kind of the same uh, tool set, but just different ways of, of working. So what does the CI server actually do? So it's a server that's kind of just waiting for an event to happen, just like your web server is waiting for somebody to make a request to it. So um, it's kind of waiting for an event 
And that event could be a whole number of different things. It could be whenever you commit some code and push the code to a repository, that fires off your script that's going to execute and do something. It could be that you just push a button on the CI server and that starts it off and starts executing it. Or it could be like a scheduled thing. Um, and so it executes that script. Um, the version control server basically is going to have to be integrated. If let's say if you're doing a commit code, it's going to have to be integrated so that it can notify the CI server that this event just happened. So that's why I said if you've got if you're using the same service that you use for version control already, it makes it a lot easier because that stuff is kind of built in for you. Uh, you don't have to think about it at all. Um, and then the CI tool runs a script that might invoke other tools and programs. So for example, Fixinators is the product my company makes, which will run a security scan through uh, your CFML code looking for issue, security issues. Uh, so what does a script look like? Here's an example of a script. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, that's kind of a strange syntax. What is that syntax? It's called YAML, uh, which stands for YAML in markup language. And it's a human friendly, and I put that in quotes, um, data serialization language for all programming languages. So similar to JSON, it kind of has the same goals as JSON where it um, has the ability to um, represent these data structures in a certain format. Yeah, human friendly. Um, so this is, uh, you can see on this slide here, we've got two examples. On the left, it's a JSON representation, and then on the right, we have an equivalent YAML representation of that same thing. So it does actually, in this case, look a little simpler than JSON, um, but it's um, it's to your preferences here. So I, I'll show you, I have this tool called Boop, B-O-O-P, which um, is kind of a handy like data converter. Um, so you can see here, I've got this JSON, and if I do, JSON to YAML, you can convert it. So that can kind of be handy to use a tool like that. Like if you're really familiar with, um, if you're really familiar with JSON, but you're kind of like getting confused a lot with YAML, um, you can kind of take your YAML and then say YAML to JSON. And if you don't, this is just a tool I have running locally, but there's probably a million online converters that, that could do that kind of thing for you. So you can go back and forth and say like, okay, now I get, I get what's happening here. We've got like a struct here with an array and, and maybe, you know, it didn't make as much sense to you looking at it like this, but those little dot dashes there mean it's an array element. So, so a couple tips about YAML. You don't need to be a YAML expert to be able to use these CI um, tools, but pretty much all of them, uh, are going to use YAML in some way. Not all of them, but most of them do. Um, so one thing to note is that indentation matters in YAML. This will be your first mistake, most likely. Actually, probably your first mistake will be that you'll put a tab in a YAML file, and it'll, you know, it'll cause it to, to fail. Um, so they don't use tabs. They only use spaces, two or four spaces, um, to indent. It doesn't matter if you use two or four. Uh, one nice thing about YAML compared to JSON is that it supports comments. So that's kind of a nice thing. They start with a pound. Okay, so let's take a look here. This is this is like our hello world um, script here uh, as far as the CI goes. And these are all going to execute kind of whenever you commit code to um, a repository, it's going to execute this um, this script here. So on the left, we have Git, GitLab. It looks like the simplest one there, probably. Um, we've got, uh, in the middle, GitHub Actions, which is probably a little bit more verbose than some of the other ones, but I think it's actually pretty powerful. I kind of like it as I get more and more into it, um, seeing some of the things that it can do. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and then on the right, we have Bitbucket. And so, so you can see it's kind of all doing the same things. At some point, we get to a point where like, it's going to run the echo command, which is just going to output whatever we, we input 
to it. And it's just simply going to output that. And so where do we store this YAML here that we have created? We're going to create a file in our repository. And if we're using GitHub Actions, it's going to go in a folder called dot GitHub slash workflows. And then we can name it whatever we want. And you can actually have multiple. And you'll see when we start working on the examples that you can actually have a number of different ones there. So some of the other servers or services that you're using, they're each going to have their own um, file name, essentially, that lets you define what should happen um, and what types of um, it should define our CI execution process, the pipeline. So in this presentation today, however, we're going to pretty much only use GitHub Actions from this point on. So everything you see is going to be possible to do in other CI platforms, but the syntaxes will, will differ um, on other platforms. Um, and, and so let me, let's run over to GitHub here. And if we go into the Actions tab here, you can see I've got a bunch of actions already defined here. And what I'm going to do here is I've created a Hello World action that is a little bit more complicated. And we'll look at the code for this. But this, this Hello one lets us input our name here. And then we can run that workflow. So this, this is kind of, like I said, we could, we could either have the event could be a button. In this case, this is like the button that is triggering it. Um, or it could be whenever we commit code to the repository, it could, it could trigger the action here. So it looks like this already finished. It only took one second. And so, right, it says echo hello Pete. So it took that input from the build process and it, and it ran it. And so if you're curious, what does the code for this script look like? This is it here, right? So we can give it a name. We don't have to, but it shows up nicely in the uh, GitHub interface if we do. Um, and then this is where we're defining our events. In this case, the workflow dispatch one means we're going to let it just listen for a button. And then this is where we're actually running the, uh, the code down here. OK. So let's take a look at the, the Hello World script just a little um, more in depth here. So this is what it would look like if we were actually going to um, have it set up so that every time we push to the main branch, it's going to um, automatically execute this, this, the jobs that are listed below. And so here we've got a job called hello. Um, and then it's got a step. The job has a step, and the step is to run the command echo hello. So pretty simple. So you can define within the GitHub action, you can define multiple jobs. The jobs could run, will run in parallel by default, unless you define dependencies. And we'll actually look at how you could do that later on. Um, and then the jobs could consist of one or more steps that it's going to do within that execution. The part where it runs, um, this could be anything, like anything executable that you could think of. In, this, in the example we've seen so far, all we've been doing is just running the echo command, which is just really, really simple and, and not all that exciting. So it's kind of just the hello world type example. But um, you, could, you could have a bat file, a shell script, or anything that's executable, and you can actually run that command. And so that's kind of going to be like the next part is figuring out like what types of commands we're going to do um, to be able to um, create something useful out of this, uh, which is right now it's not really that useful. It's just outputting stuff. Um, so what we want to do is what I think, I think you should look at your, your journey to CI in two phases. So phase one is going to be what can I do with the minimal amount of effort uh, that's going to provide something useful for me? And I would start there and not go beyond that. So don't try and 
have some sort of elaborate testing mechanism set up right off the bat, unless you already have something like that working and it's just not running automatically, then maybe go for that. But um, you definitely don't want to go too fast. So start slow, start with some simple things that are actually really, really useful. Um, and if you do that, you could probably put it in place within a couple hours and you'll have something that's actually useful for you, um, providing feedback that's, that's going to help you do a better job and have higher quality code. Just within that, really some really simple tools you can run. Um, once you've got that down and pretty stable, and if your team is so inclined, and this really is important too, because if you go for like the phase two type things, um, it's gonna require a lot more effort, but it's also gonna require a lot more maintenance because if you set up tests that are gonna execute and run, and then you change the code that causes the tests to break, let's say, uh, because maybe you refactor, refactor something, you change how something works, uh, but then you don't go and fix the tests or make sure the test, test still makes sense. Now you just got this build that's going to fail and it's not gonna provide, everybody's just gonna start ignoring it essentially, that it's failing and you're not gonna get any value out of it. So it's, that's why I say it's better off to just start with a couple things maybe that are going to provide useful insight and that people pay attention to if it breaks uh, versus getting too elaborate with it. Um, so let's start with something really simple that every single person who's writing CFML would find useful. And that is, does it compile or do we have syntax errors? So wouldn't that be real? I'm sure you've all seen a cold fusion co compiler error. Like if you typo a tag name, like CF Parma, like we saw earlier, that's going to uh, cause your application to break. And if you commit code with the, that kind of thing in there, let's say you're, you were in a rush and you didn't fully test something and you committed it, um, you, you wouldn't want to necessarily deploy that code um, with, with that type of error in it. So, it's going to provide something really useful. So here's a here's an example of a script you can run on GitHub, which will actually. So what it's going to do here, I'll go through in detail here. So whenever you push your code, it's going to uh, run this job called CF compile, and we you see here I've defined container image, and that container image is pointing to Adobe's. Cold Fusion 2021 update for Docker image, right? So what's nice about that is that we could uh, say we want to make sure that this compiles on Cold Fusion 2018 and 2021 because we're in the process of doing a migration. We could actually uh, do that, or let's say we're we're in the process of upgrading from 2018, or maybe even you know Cold Fusion eight or 10 or whatever version you're on and you're, but you want to be running the latest, but you're not sure if you're going to have issues in your code and you're wondering like, will it even compile, let's say on Cold Fusion 2021? Well, you can add this. And if you add this script, it will, every time you, um, you commit code, it's going to check and make sure that, that all of your code compiles and using the CF compile task. So one, one thing here we're doing here as well as we're passing the environment variables into the Docker container. So in this case, we need to uh, tell it that we accept the EULA. Uh, and here we're checking out the code. So what it's gonna do here, in our previous example in the Hello World, we didn't actually even do this step. We didn't, we didn't download the code that we just committed, um, but that's kind of required here uh, in GitHub Actions that you actually pull the code in or check it out prior to um, so that you can work with it. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this command, which is the CF compile tool that comes built in in Cold Fusion. And we just have to pass a couple things to it. We're passing the web root, which is going to be the GitHub workspace. And that's the basically like the current directory um, of, of what your 
your uh, we just checked it out here in this step. So it's going into that variable folder name called GitHub underscore workspace. Um, and so when you actually execute this task, um, it's going to programs can be written to return an, an error or exit code. And so thankfully, I wasn't sure when I ran this if this was going to actually work because if they didn't write this to return the exit codes, um, then it wouldn't have been so useful. But thankfully, whoever wrote CF compile over at Adobe was very on top of things and they returned an exit code. So what that means is we can really use this into, uh, into CI. So we can, when the program runs and returns an exit code, we can say, okay, if it returns a zero, then um, that means it ran successfully. If it returns a one, that means there was some kind of error. And so here you can see the compiler error. Uh, when I cause the compiler error, it's going to um, it's going to fail with that red X there. And then when I, once I fixed it, it's going to show up as a green check mark. Um, so so that's really super useful to us here. So let's take a look at this example. Um, what I'm going to do. So this is my CI script and. It's gonna, here's the CF compile code that we just looked at. And it's actually gonna do a few other things, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, and let me, that's what I'm gonna do is we're just gonna go with this test here. And we're gonna actually duplicate that CF Parma error that we saw uh, happened on a Friday afternoon. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna commit this here. Pause it another. Compile. Okay, so I'm going to push that to the repository. And now what you're going to see here when I go into actions here, I'll make my screen a little bigger here. Um, so we see this this like little yellow or orange or whatever. I guess it's supposed to be orange, kind of orange or brown um, thing going on here. And we can see these are my jobs that I've defined in that. CI process, but we're just going to look at the CF compile one. And we see here that's pulling that Docker image. And what do we see here? We're seeing this red X. And it's even telling us that it was test.cfm, unknown tag, CF query parma. So that's super useful for anybody. And that can take, you can have that set up, I believe, in an hour. Um, and yeah, if you're running into issues getting this going on whatever platform, uh, I've worked with pretty much like a dozen of them. So I'm very familiar with how they all work. And if you, so if you have questions, um, feel free to, to ask me. But I think this is, this is something that anybody could find extremely useful to have. Um, so do you see how quickly this, and this is gonna run automatically for us every time that we commit code. So the problem with like, uh, you know, you've, you've had that CF compile tools sitting on your computer and you've probably never even ran it, right? You never even, maybe even knew it was there. So um, that's what's really nice about the CI tools is that it doesn't, you can be as lazy as you want. It's gonna automatically do it for you every single time. So you don't have to worry about you know, wasting your time doing it, it's going to do it automatically for you. And hopefully you'll you'll see the green check marks a lot, but sometimes you're going to see that that red X where you need to take an action and, and correct it. So and you can see pretty cool. It only took about 15 seconds for that to run and figure out. So we were able to figure out about 15 seconds after we committed that, um, that there was a problem. The whole thing ran in 39 seconds here. Okay, so next up here. Okay, so next, let's look at finding some security vulnerabilities within your uh, code. So CFML static code analysis uh, tool called Fixinator, which is a company my, or product my company makes. Um, it's a commercial product and it's entirely focused on cold fusion. It's focused on security issues within your cold fusion code. Um, it's well maintained and updated frequently, highly configurable, and it's really designed to run inside a CI platform. Um, 
And so you can get a trial key of it at fixneater.app slash try if you'd like to give it a whirl. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I've worked with like a dozen of these CI platforms. And so for example, like if you're running Azure DevOps, um, this is this is what the script's gonna look like to run Fixinator on that. Um, and even kind of shows you like, this is how you set up the script. Uh, so there's a lot of um, documentation for it. Um, one of the cool things here, you'll notice here that some CI tools actually have UI set up for um, reporting security issues. So we can see the Fixinator scan here is showing up in our CI process and it provides a lot of additional UI where um, it, it ends up being useful. So um, Azure, Azure DevOps has some additional CI, um, GitLab, Bitbucket. I don't have it actually set up in GitHub Actions yet, uh, but that's kind of next on my list to provide that kind of uh, feedback with an integrated feedback. Um, but a lot of these platforms have that enabled. Um, just the GitLab has a different language um, output that's required for it. So it takes a little bit of work to get it um, the way that they like it. Okay, and so this is here, this screenshot is showing like what it might look like in a GitLab um, security report within their UI. So you can see here, it's even got the solution here of what, how you can fix the issue. Um, so let's take a look at the Fixinator example. So I'm gonna go back to this and um, I'm gonna change it to something that is, I'm gonna fix this, um, I'm gonna fix that syntax error now, right? So now it's gonna pass the compile test, but it's no longer going to pass the a security test that Fixinator is going to run on. So let's go ahead and commit this. Um, So now we're, we're creating a security issue in here. And if we go back to the repository here. So it's going to be running through its um, process again. And it's just gonna take a few seconds here. We'll bring this up. So while this is running actually, uh, Oh, yeah, so we'll see here that it it's, it failed the Fixinator scan here and is saying, all right, it found, we found SQL injection on test.cfm line three, and these are your possible fixes that you might wanna look at as far as fixing that. So that's how you would run Fixinator within the CI, um, but you can actually also run it within uh, you're locally, so if I run fixinator cfm and there's an auto fix feature here. Um, so we're seeing kind of the same um, output here, but now we can actually say, all right, and keep your eye up here when we fix this, it's going to automatically fix that for us and we can commit that fix, fixed, fix the security issue, okay. Commit that again, push it, and our, our CI process is going to kick off again. We're gonna run through fixed security issue, and that hopefully while it's running, we're gonna get the green check mark once that's done because we fixed it properly. So it's Fixinator does a lot more than just SQL injection. Um, it looks for several of the known uh, CFML backdoors that it 
hackers have like put these malicious CFM files on servers via upload exploits and things like that. A lot of times it's the same uh, file that's been used so it can detect those. Um, it looks for vulnerable uh, CFML dependencies. So if there's been like a, a, a library, say like uh, ForgeBox libraries that had a, um, if the library had a security issue and then they fixed it, keeps track of those and looks, scans your box.json and will let you know. Um, can detect several vulnerable jar files. So for example, if I threw in like a vulnerable log4j jar file into the repository, it would warn me on that. Uh, and then also just tons of different coding vulnerabilities and I kind of go through all of them. You can see a number of those are all listed, remote code execution, uh, path traversals, et cetera. Um, so it's also quite configurable so you can um, set it up if you want to ignore certain types of scanners, like say for example, like maybe your app has tons of cross-site scripting issues in it and you're kind of overwhelmed and you don't want to focus on those right now. So you could tell it to ignore cross-site scripting for now. You can also tell it it has different confidence levels and severity levels as well. So when Fixinator finds something, um, it's going to give you a, let me show you here in the output. So it, seeing here, it's, it found it with high confidence, but sometimes it might find something with a low or a medium confidence. And so you can tell it to not um, fail your build if it finds something with like a medium confidence. Only only fail if it's like high confidence or a, and a high severity, for example, you can do that as well. So SQL injection is really dangerous. Um, so it gets a high severity, but something maybe a little less dangerous, like using a weak encryption algorithm might have a, a low severity and it wouldn't cause it to um, uh, fail on those if you've configured it that way. Um, so you can also, one other thing I find, like sometimes like you've written your own function that handles certain security issues and they handle it properly. Like, so for example, if you, instead of using encode for HTML, if you've got your own function called my own awesome HTML encoder, um, you can configure Fixinator to, to know that that's gonna be safe for cross-site scripting as well. Um, or another one I see a lot is like, let's say you've got a variable like application.table prefix defined in, in your application CFC and it's just a hard-coded value. Well, it's not really vulnerable to SQL injection, but pretty much every SQL injection scanner is gonna complain about it. So Fixinator would let you um, say that those types of things are okay. And then finally, if it's finding something that um, you don't think is an issue, you can also add a special comment above the where it's finding it, and it, that can also cause it to be ignored. Um, one other thing as well, you, instead of scanning your entire repository every time you commit code, you could have it scan just the, the files that were changed, uh, which is kind of a handy feature. It makes it run a little faster if you've got a huge amount of code. All righty, so oh, I should go back to full screen here. So, uh, some additional code scanners that are out there. Um, these are open source ones, Code Checker and CF Lint. Um, they they might take a little bit of config um, to get going to your liking because some of the the things within them might be you might say that they're maybe more opinionated um, about how a certain thing should work. So, for example, you could you could set it up to um, require semicolons in your CF script, but some people might say, you know, I don't like to use semicolons if they're optional and they're not required. So there, there might be some like opinion things that you can might need to tweak within those, um, but all that is possible to do if you if you'd like to set those up as well. So um, those are worth looking into. Um, I do actually have those running in here as well. And so, and these are like, you can just, if you're running GitHub Actions, you can just, you know, copy this whole job here to, to run Fixinator. You can copy this whole part here to run CF Lint. This part here is running Code Checker. And so what we're doing here, actually we're using um, a Docker image I created called CFML CI Tools, um, which is based on um, another Docker container I created called Minibox, which is based on Command Box. So what it is basically, um, Ordis obviously makes Command Box, and they make uh, 
command box light, which probably most people don't realize it even exists. But with the light version, it's really small. And that's important in CI because it will help your scripts run faster if it doesn't have to download like a really large um, Docker container to, to execute your tools. So if you're, the size of your binaries that you're, you're going to run is smaller, it should hopefully execute faster. So the CFML CI tools, we probably can just pop over there and see what's in there. Um, so it, it has Fixinator command, it has CFML compiler, uh, command box code checker, uh, CF lint, CF format, CF config, doc box, and semantic release. So these are all just different tools that are um, bundled within this, and it's it's pretty small um, in terms of size. It's like less than 100 megabytes for the whole thing of all the tools. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options to configure these tools. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but if you check out there, they all have a lot of documentation that's, that's really good, and um, you can figure out what options you want to turn on. Uh, okay, so another thing that might be, you might think is handy is, let's say, um, maybe instead of running that like security scan every, uh, every time you commit code, maybe you only run, run it once a week on the entire repository. Or maybe you're only scanning changed files, but you want to do a full scan once a week or once a month. Or you could do that with um, a scheduled event. So it supports cron syntax. So instead of waiting for an on push, it's going to use this cron syntax here to, in this case, it's going to run at 930 uh, UTC on the first of every month with this particular example. We've already seen this in action. So um, on workflow dispatch tells it that we're going to wait for a button push. Um, and you can actually add this to, like, for example, my CI here. I don't know if I added it. No, but I could add it here also. So like if I wanted to rerun this again, um, for, for whatever reason, maybe something changed that's not like within your code, an external thing you're trying to use, um, you could run this and it would add the button there that would allow you to run it manually. Uh, so this is how we, we accept inputs within the manual. Uh, workflow dispatch, you can define a bunch of different input variables. And so that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, you could do all kinds of things with this. So accepting inputs and having it do different things based on what you put in. It might be handy, like for debugging certain things. Um, uh, and then you can reference that variable in your CI script with the dollar sign curly brace, curly brace github.event.inputs. whatever the, the name is. Um, so here's a handy one I use sometimes uh, on GitHub when you do like a GitHub release and you let's say you want to package something up whenever you publish a new release, you can use this um, for that. So whenever a tag is published, starting with the letter V in this case, because I have the pattern I have here is V star, it's going to cause this um, to trigger. Uh, so I can actually show you an example of that running. So if we go back to here. And let's say I create a new release here. version 1.0.2, and I'm going to tag it as version 1.0.2 and create a new tag. And then we can create a release notes here. All right, so we published this release. What's going to happen is it's going to trigger that action um, in an error. So 
right now we see it's running release.yaml, which is going to run all these things here. And we are actually using something called a dependence here. Here, So what we're doing is basically making sure that all of these work uh, and run successfully. And then um, it's going to actually publish this bill here as a Docker uh, container here. So we can see here right now we have version 1.0.1 published. And once this finishes, still running through all of its things, and this is actually doing a lot more um, that we, we will get into. Uh, but we just need to run through all these different tests. And once that finishes, it should be any second now, it will publish it. We'll come back and check on that in a sec. Um, so another thing that the CI platform, pretty much all of them have this, um, is something called secrets. So for example, Fixinator has an API key that you'll need to pass to it. And with that, the best way to, to do that is to store it as a secret. And you can actually create a repository level secret uh, where you where you define your various API keys or passwords or anything like you want it like that. And they will store that securely. And when your action runs, it will have um, it will have uh, the ability to use that secret. Um, one nice, the reason you want to use the secret rather than uh, something else would be that GitHub Actions would automatically protect that secret. So if you, for example, just tried to like output it to the build log, it will actually just mask it with stars because it knows it's a secret, so it doesn't want to expose it accidentally. So it protects against things like that as well. Um, so, so in order for the secret to become available, you have to actually pass it in um, to the to this step somehow. So like in this case, I'm passing it into, I'm setting an environment variable with the key. All right. Let's see if this one finished. Yeah, it did. OK, so I set it up so it depends on all these. And once all those happen, it's going to run this Docker. Uh, let's find that one. This is release.yaml. And um, by the way, all this, everything in this repository, github.com slash foundaya slash cfml dash ci examples, you can actually go and grab all these files and, and tweak them to your needs. Um, yeah, so here's the Docker one. So this is where it's um, it's, depend it's setting up its dependencies. It wants all these jobs to, to run successfully first before it will actually run this job is what we're saying there. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm logging into the GitHub's Docker registry and I am pushing this to um, to the registry. So I'm building a Docker image and pushing it that that you could. So basically, once all the tests have passed, we're we're saying, okay, it's it's good, it's safe to release that version, and it will publish it. If if the tests fail, it won't actually get to this publish step. So it's kind of a cool thing to do. All right, the matrix, and I tried really hard not to include a picture of the movie Matrix here. Um, what the matrix feature allows you to do is pretty cool. So let's say you wanted to, um, in, in this case, I have like a, a 2D matrix here, but it could just be simply like a one dimensional array. In most cases, that's how I use that. This is actually a 2D matrix where we've got two sets of variables, CF engine and then Java. And what this will do is it will run this job. In this case, it would run it with 
every possible combination. So it's going to run it. Um, let's see, probably four times here. Uh, it would run it with CF Engine, Adobe 2021, and then Open JDK 11, and then it'll run it with Adobe 2021, Open JDK 8, Adobe 2018, Open JDK 11, and then again with eight. So that's really useful if you're building something that needs to run on multiple platforms or multiple versions of Cold Fusion. You can set it up so your tests can run with the same code. It will repeat the entire process with a different variable. So uh, let's see, I've got a matrix example here. Yeah, so let's run this, run this workbook. Ooh. So in this case, I'm gonna compile using different versions. And um, you can see here, it's already, I actually have two matrices, two jobs to find. In my compile one, it's, it's just running on two different um, CF engines, but I also created a chef matrix to show how it can be more, uh, more dimensional in that. Where's my matrix one here? Yeah, so the chef matrix, you pick a protein, you pick a side, and it's, and then we're just echoing the protein with the side. So you can see here, chef matrix is, is going to run all these different times here. It's running with chicken and rice, beef and rice. So you can see it reruns that code. I didn't have to redefine the code. I've just got this variable and it will do it will do the matrix thing for you. So that's really useful if you've got, if you want to test on different versions of things, is usually how that's that type of feature is leveraged. <laughs> uh, okay. So we already have kind of looked at this, the job uh, dependencies. So let's say I've got um, a build or a publish or something like that that I'm doing. Um, and this is maybe more like for if you're going to just get into the deployment side of things, um, you can say that this build job needs needs test to finish and successfully before it will actually um, run. Okay, next runs on. Uh, you you might have noticed I've been glossing over this, but it, it usually our scripts say runs on Ubuntu latest. Um, which is, so if you're not familiar with Ubuntu, it's, it's a Linux distribution. Um, and it, it supports different runner types besides that Ubuntu latest. Um, the Linux ones tend to be the quickest to get up and running, um, but you could also, you could run it on Windows latest, for example, and then would run on Windows 2022. You can even run it on Mac. So that's kind of uh, handy because let's say if you're doing like iOS development or something you need to and you want to like do some, run some tests on iOS um, you can have it run on Mac um, or let's say you, you have you want to actually run your server on a Windows environment you can actually spin up a Windows server and, and do all kinds of testing on an actual Windows environment okay permissions within the repository um, you can define, uh, there's different things that, by default, it has permission to, to do a lot. Um, so you want to scope this down a bit. Most most likely, you probably just need permissions contents read, and you can put that at the top level of your um, YAML, but you could also do it within a job. So for example here, in this example, we're defaulting to uh, contents read, but then in this particular job, we're giving it more permission to do something else. Okay, so um, I promised to fix this Friday deployment problem once and for all, and this is my solution to it. So um, what we can actually do is write our own tools in Cold Fusion using um, command box task runners. So all you have to do is create a CFC or, and in this case, I'm putting it right in my repository, but it doesn't have to be in my repository. I could download it from another repository or it could be something, you know, you put on ForgeBox or whatever, right? So all it needs is a component with a function called run. 
and then we can run it. Uh, and if we if we call the error function, it's going to cause that the return code to be um, to be a, a one, which is going to cause it to fail. And if it's if it's not a Friday, then it's all good. So I can actually test this using command box here. I'll just do a task run task file um, tests task runner it's Friday. So if we run it here, it's going to say, okay, it's Tuesday, all good to go. So you can see I actually have this implemented in our release script here. Uh, so in the release script, that was one of our dependencies before we actually published, was we ran this Friday check here. And so you can see it's up here, okay, it's Tuesday, all good. And if it were a Friday, we would have failed the build and not let um, the publish happen. So um, that's one way to fix the problem. <laughs> so pretty cool. You can write your own CI tools and CFML really easily. Um, and the the way I'm actually running that is also pretty easy here. Um, I'm using the CFML CI tools Docker image, and that which which includes command box, and then I just have to do task run, and then give it a task file. So pretty simple. All right. Okay, so now we're getting into the phase two. We only got a few minutes left, but. Um, probably time I show you the actual app we have here. This is the actual app that is in this repository and it's a calculator, okay? So we've got five plus three, let me reload it. We'll start from scratch, five plus three equals eight. So that's how the app works. We look behind the scenes um, and we run this again. It's making a request to kep.cfc um, and it's calling a remote method here called add return format, JSON, X equals five, Y equals three, and the response it gives back is the eight. So that's something that's super easy that we could test, right? We could test this a number of different ways. Um, so we're gonna look at some of those different ways that we're, we, can, we can test that. So, but in order to test that, we actually have to start the server up and running um, within our environment. So let me look at the release here is where I've got this running. And I'm doing all kinds of things, but here's where I am testing the this job here I define called the test API. I'm running it on Ubuntu, checking out the code. And in this case, I'm using Docker Compose up to start it up, but we could have also just, if we were using command box, uh, we could use command box to start up a server inside the CI environment locally. Um, we could also, yeah, in this case, I'm using Docker, like I said, but um, many different ways to do it. We're going to run this uh, step here called wait for the server to be up. And what this is going to do is just kind of like make a request to the server using curl. It's going to wait for a 200 status code. And then once we know it's up, we're like, okay, we're, we're up. And it's just making this request to this URL here. Um, so that doesn't take long for it to get past that step. And then now I'm just writing like a really simple curl test here. So I'm using curl and I am, in this case, I'm calling that URL here and I'm checking to see if the answer that we got back was eight. And if it is, we're gonna get pass. If not, we're gonna get fail. So there's another test we've got. All right, now I'm going to use something called Postman. It's a pretty cool app that's really good for testing APIs, and you can write all kinds of scripts in it. So here I've written a script where it's going to, and what's nice about Postman is you can, it's a nice GUI desktop app that you can just run and you can see all your results here as you're developing stuff. You can make sure it's working good for your APIs. So here I'm saying status code 200, content type, uh, checking the content type, making sure it's valid JSON, and the result was eight when I added 
pi plus three. Um, so I can actually export that as a JSON file, which I've got somewhere here. And then Postman has an open source tool called Newman, which takes, this is the tests that we just saw in the app, but this is the JSON format version of it that we are going to run here. And npx, which is running as node Newman, run, run this test file. All right, so that's gonna run. And then finally, um, we're gonna run Puppeteer. And this is actually going to run this test.js. Let me find that. So what Puppeteer is gonna do is actually launch a browser, go to this URL, um, and then it's going to look for the input with the ID of X, and it's gonna set the value of it to five. And then it's gonna look for the input with the value with the ID of Y and set that to three. And then it's gonna click the button. So what it's doing is it's really actually emulating this. What I'm doing here is it's going like this, it's going like this, I'm writing a script, and then it's going like this. And then what it's going to do is gonna see, um, check the value of Z, which is gonna be this box here, and make sure that it equals eight. And if it equals eight, then we pass that test. And if it's not, then it's gonna exit it as with an exit code of one, which is gonna cause the whole thing to fail. So a whole bunch of cool tests. It's also going to take a screenshot here. So let's take a look at these results here. Um, test API. So we ran the curl test. Um, it passed, the answer was eight. We ran the Postman Newman tests. It ran all those tests and passed them all. Running Puppeteer. Um, it found that the value was eight. It saved a screenshot. And the screenshot actually gets saved as an artifact, which we can download. So this is the screenshot that it took of our app while it was running in CI. So that's pretty cool, huh? So you can see that it inputted the number five and inputted the number three, and then it, uh, it got the right answer eight. So we can actually visually, um, we can actually visually verify that it's working through that screenshot as well. Um, so, okay. So we can also add more tests. Um, this, I believe, is also running test box, which is um, going to let's see where are those tests. Yeah, so here's our test box, which is you can write your tests in CFML, and we're saying we're going to expect when we call the, the calc CFC and we call the add function 5 plus 3, we're expecting it to be 8. And we're expecting this to be negative three and this to be zero. And that bacon plus lettuce throws an exception. So we've got all these things tested and those are all passing. So now what happens if I break this? So I'm just gonna go like this, plus one. All right, so let's go back to our app, make sure it's broken. Oops, five plus three equals nine, okay broken. All right, let's now let's commit this to our CI and watch everything light up like a Christmas tree. Um, break critical function of the app. So what we're going to find is this is going to start to fail pretty big here when it runs through all these tests. They're all going to fail. I'm gonna let that run in the background for a second while we finish up the slides here. Um, and this is, yeah, we already saw our mission critical code. And let me just see how this is running. Did I push that? No, I didn't push it. Okay, so we'll come back and check on that, how bad that breaks in a second. Um, so with, 
with, if we do have really, really good automated testing in place, like like this app actually does with all these all those different tests I showed you, um, making sure that it works in, in various different ways, you actually could deploy uh, on a Friday without being so worried because you, you, you're you going to have a lot of tests in place verifying things. Uh, but just because you can doesn't always mean you should. And so we've only scratched the surface of what's possible with CI. So keep looking into it. You can do um, so many different things with it. Um, and But like I said, start small and start with something that's going to create some value for you. And let's just check on this before we get into it. Huh. Awesome, oh, okay. I have to, Awesome. Yeah. I'd have to publish a release for it to break in all those ways, but you guys get the idea. Um, so we just had one, uh, I think we had one question from Greg Stevens, um, who's okay. asking, what is the data source for the vulnerability feature of Fixinator? Is there an API to it that we could all use? Uh, no, it's kind of a proprietary uh, database that's included within the tool. Um, with the enterprise version of Fixinator, you'd have um, the ability to run that on your own servers. But um, yeah, it's, it runs on a, on a cloud hosted server by default. Right on. All right. So Greg, that means send credit card information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Pete. Uh, as usual, no brilliant stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to rewatch this like 17 times to, to fully <laughs> understand and grasp all of the amazing stuff that you showed awesome. us. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Definitely, definitely appreciate you. Did anyone else have any kind of questions? I've, I've got my gift card question here. And it's, oh, what, yes. does my, what does my last name mean uh, in German? Freitag. Uh, it's a type of refrigerator. <laughs> All right, we got some okay. we got some answers in the chat. Let's see, did anybody get it yet? I have no idea what your last name means, so I don't okay. know any of them. So the it. answer, uh, yes, I see the answer in there. The answer is correct. Answer is Friday. All right. So, so who was the first first. person to say it? Let's see. Looking like Annette. Annette? Yeah, Annette looks like Annette got that correctly. Um, Annette, if you could please message uh, myself or Apurva or even Pete, uh, one of us, probably me or Apurva, with your email address so that we can get you that card. Congratulations. And now I know what Pete Freitag's last name means, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, thank you. I'm going to I'm gonna pull us out of here into okay. the outro. And please, everyone, if you could give us your feedback on Pete's talk. This is very important for the speakers. They use this information to get better at their craft. Um, also, on the right there, we've got a link to Pete's company, Foundio, if you want to click there and just send your credit card information. Uh, basically, everything he makes is wonderful, so just buy it all. Uh, that would be wonderful. And coming up next, in just about 23 minutes, we've got Real World WebSockets. So please make sure you stick around for that. And thanks again, Pete. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.